I'm Darius Spearman, and you're watching African Elements. Even before the Civil War, black people fought in America's wars with hopes of gaining acceptance and recognition as U.S. citizens. Even so, the armed forces remained segregated through World War II. Black soldiers and black women in the Army's auxiliary units were routinely disregarded and mistreated. In this video, I explore the essential role black Americans played in the World War II effort and how despite these obstacles, they contributed to the cause at home and abroad. All that, coming up next. Thank you for watching African Elements. If it's your first time here, welcome. We produce content in Black and Africana studies and bring it right here where the people are at. To support this content, be sure and drop a like, comment, and subscribe. Or you can become one of the history makers in our growing Patreon community. For a deeper dive into this topic, click the link above where I've compiled a collection of articles offering full, in-depth coverage. But for now, let's jump in. African Americans have a record of serving in the armed forces with distinction. That was true of the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment's siege at Fort Wagner in the Civil War. It remained true during World War I when Henry Johnson served with the 369th Infantry Regiment, also known as the Harlem Hellfighters. Having earned the respect of the French allies, Johnson became the first American to receive France's highest military honor, the Croix de Guerre. Still, black and white military personnel served in divided units since the Civil War. Black service members experienced separate and inferior segregated sleeping quarters, transportation, canteens, and even church services. Despite mountains of evidence to the contrary, many still considered black soldiers cowardly, inept, and unqualified to lead. In 1925, an Army War College study concluded that in the process of evolution, the American Negro has not progressed as far as the other subspecies of the human family. As a race, he has not developed leadership qualities. His mental inferiority and the inherent weakness of his character are factors that must be considered with great care in the preparation of any plan for his employment in war. In the past wars, the Negro has made a fair laborer, but an inferior technician. As a fighter, he has been inferior to the white man even when led by white officers. Belying the War College study, the Tuskegee Airmen, sometimes known as the Red Tails, composed the 332nd Fighter Group. The Red Tails gained distinction by escorting bomber pilots into enemy territory. Formed in 1941, the pilots underwent extensive training at the Army Airfield based in Tuskegee, Alabama. They became the first black military aviators in the U.S. Army Air Corps, which later became the Air Force. During their service, Tuskegee Airmen flew more than 15,000 missions in Europe and North Africa during World War II. When moved to Italy and given the opportunity, they shot down 12 German bombers in two days, using slower, second-hand planes. By the war's end, they earned more than 150 distinguished flying crosses. The call to join the war effort also brought women into the labor force, but like their male counterparts, black women experienced segregation and discrimination. In the various organizations designed for each military branch, white women could expect training in medical or leadership roles and the promise of career opportunities. In contrast, black women remain relegated to menial labor. Despite these limitations, black women distinguished themselves in service. In March of 2022, President Joe Biden signed an act awarding a Congressional Gold Medal to the women of the 6,888th Battalion, or 6888. At the behest of then First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and civil rights leader Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, the Army finally allowed black women to join their white counterparts and serve overseas in the Women's Army Corps, or WAC. In 1945, the Army sent the 6888 abroad with a specific task. According to a report from the Adjutant General, Since D-Day, June 6, 1944, airplane hangars in Birmingham, London, held undelivered Christmas packages, and a constant stream of incoming mail added to an already massive backlog of letters, 7 million. Critical for troop morale, for many it had been months since they'd received a letter from home. 
the 6888 cleared out a backlog of about 17 million pieces of mail in three months, half the projected time. The battalion would go on to serve in France before returning home. Housing, mess halls, and recreation facilities were segregated by race and sex, forcing them to set up their own operations. In addition for fighting for opportunities abroad, black organizers led an additional battle on the home front. Another crusade black people took up during the 1940s was the Double V Campaign. James G. Thompson led the newspaper campaign, reminding Americans that while fighting fascism abroad, there remained an unfinished fight against racism at home. The Double V Campaign, Victory Over Fascism Abroad and Racism at Home, was more than a slogan. Black Americans at home and overseas faced constant disregard for their personhood. Favorable treatment of German and Italian prisoners of war was particularly offensive to African American soldiers. Lloyd Brown recalled a Salina, Kansas restaurant owner who told him and other black troops, you boys know we don't serve colored here, while German prisoners of war were eating at the lunch counter. However, as with World War I, wartime industries brought opportunities to black workers. Often called the Second Great Migration, the black population in the western United States grew by 443,000, or 33%, during the World War II years. California alone gained a 772% rise in its African-American population. Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Oakland, Los Angeles, and San Diego collectively absorbed 70% of the increase in the region's African-American population during the 1940s. These areas were heavily affected by rapidly expanding defense industries. However, here too, black workers faced heavy discrimination and mistreatment. In San Diego, an aircraft production center, African-American employees faced unwarranted pay deductions or transfers, anti-black remarks by supervisors or co-workers, or racial segregation. Restrictive covenants barred 95% of World War II-era housing to blacks. As a result, San Diego's Logan Heights, southeast of downtown, received almost all of that city's African-American newcomers. Between 1945 and 1948, the city's black residents filed more lawsuits contesting covenants than the rest of the nation combined. Many of these lawsuits were filed by Lauren Miller, an NAACP attorney who developed a national reputation through his legal work against housing discrimination. Elsewhere, just north of San Francisco, Port Chicago Naval Base became a significant supply conduit for the war effort in the Pacific in 1942. By that time, black naval personnel dominated the workforce. However, their importance as a supplier in the Pacific theater came at the expense of safe working conditions as the stevedores worked at breakneck speeds to supply the warships. On the evening of July 17, 1944, about half of the facility's black dock workers were loading two ammunition ships when an explosion destroyed the ships and much of nearby Port Chicago. 320 men, including 202 African Americans, died. Three weeks later, 328 surviving stevedores at nearby Mare Island refused an order to load ammunition ships. Through threats and coercion from Navy officials, all but 50 resumed work. The remaining men were arrested as mutineers, leading to the longest and largest mutiny trial in naval history. Although later reduced, a military tribunal found the defendants guilty and sentenced each to 15 years' detention and a dishonorable discharge. To address racial segregation in the United States military and rampant discrimination in defense industries, seasoned labor organizer and socialist A. Philip Randolph and his protege Bayard Rustin proposed a march on Washington in 1941. As we saw previously, Randolph is best known for his work in achieving union recognition for the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters within the ranks of the American Federation of Labor. Rustin was born on March 17, 1912. In the 1930s, he became heavily involved in pacifist groups and early civil rights protests. Despite Rustin's development into one of the most outstanding organizers in the history of the civil rights movement, Rustin had two liabilities that would later cause the civil rights community to shun him. Along with his early affiliation with the Communist Party during a period when the party fought aggressively to organize and fight for the rights of black workers, Rustin was also an openly gay black man. I'll discuss how misogyny and homophobia hurt the civil rights movement in a separate video. Randolph's call for a march on Washington threatened to expose U.S. hypocrisy, fighting a war against fascism abroad with a segregated army rampant with discrimination. 
Recognizing the propaganda vulnerability of having tens of thousands of black American citizens march on the streets of Washington for basic human dignity, Roosevelt assuaged Randolph by signing Executive Order 8802. While the order failed to dismantle segregation within the armed forces, it established a Fair Employment Practices Commission to ban racial discrimination in government defense industries. Considering the executive order of victory, Randolph called off the march. Still, the FEPC, whose mission was to investigate complaints of discrimination against industries receiving government contracts, lacked sufficient resources and enforcement. Randolph continued organizing to hold the FEPC accountable. To that end, the March on Washington movement organized a series of mass public rallies in the summer of 1942. On May 27, 1943, Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9346, establishing a new Committee on Fair Employment Practice with greater enforcement authority. As a result, the Fair Employment Practices Committee proved a powerful ally. The FEPC soon opened numerous Western workplaces previously closed to African Americans, white women, and other people of color. World War II was a continuation of a historical pattern. Black Americans sought acceptance and recognition as citizens through military service and fought with distinction only to find their efforts minimized, overlooked, and disregarded. To this day, African Americans continue to be overrepresented in the military. Black service members made enormous contributions to the victory against fascism abroad only to find the victory at home unfulfilled. I'm Darius Spearman, and if you're still here, maybe consider joining the history makers in our Patreon community who make it possible for me to continue to make this content in black history. As always, your support is greatly appreciated. If you'd like to become a history maker, you can join them for as little as a dollar a month and gain early access to ad-free videos. Otherwise, thank you for watching, and until next time, I'll see you in the comments.